Okay, so uh, thanks, Sandy, um, for the kind introduction. Um, so, uh, you know, as you know, like these are like really exciting times uh, in the field of uh, information technology, right? I mean, uh, we genuinely don't know what comes next, uh, and so it's it's really a pleasure for me, in fact, a, an absolute honor for me to come to Stanford uh, to this cauldron of innovation and um, share with you some of the work that I've been doing in the space of uh, computational memory and get your opinion on that. Uh, I would also appreciate if the if the uh, if the lecture is going to be uh, uh, you know uh, very interactive so that I can receive questions during the during the talk. Okay, um, so where do I come from? Um, I'm from IBM Research in Zurich. Um, I just put up this picture to show that it is actually a very old research lab. Uh, IBM Research was established. Uh, the, the Zurich lab was established in 19, uh, 1956. Um, and you can see, you know, from these pictures here, you know, and I, luckily we don't dress like that anymore <laughs> in Zurich. So currently, um, the lab is located in this beautiful village um, of Rushlikon by the by the Zurich Lake, um, and uh, but off late, it's looking more like that. <laughs> so all the more reason for me uh, to be in California now. Okay, so this is the agenda for the day. So first, I want to. Uh, you know, talk about, okay, what is this in-memory computing or what is computational memory uh, and why we need it. So it's, a, it's the first part. Then I will uh, look at what is, what constitutes this computational memory, you know, what do we have in there. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the operations, some of the computational tasks that you can perform in, in computational memory. Um, and, um, you know, then uh, we will look at, uh, you know, this concept of mixed precision in memory computing, and finally I would conclude with a summary and outlook. Okay, so the motivation. So I'm sure that um, you guys have seen, or at least some of the statistics that is listed here. Um, we have something like you know 2.5 exabytes of data created every day, right? Uh, and 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years. Uh, and the global scientific output doubles every nine years. So it's, it's truly remarkable the amount of data that, that we are generating. Uh, on top of it, we have you know the the IoT revolution going on, right? Uh, so if you look at some of the estimates, uh, we will have something like 30 billion devices connected to the internet by 2020, which is just a couple of years from now, right? And uh, it, it, it is all the way from you know uh, smartphones to you know kitchen appliances, and all these things are generating all this tremendous amount of data. Um, we are expecting something like you know, 40 trillion gigabytes of data to be generated by all these devices which will be on the internet. So, um, so the impact of that is that an increasing number of our computers are literally uh, combing through these vast amounts of data that is being generated and trying to you know, derive insights and intelligence. So that's what they're doing. Um, so much so that uh, you know, many of us believe that we are on the cusp of you know, a revolution uh, in, in artificial intelligence. So why is it important? Because uh, you know, this AI revolution will have significant impact on our computing systems, right? Um, and there's an immense computation challenge involved there. And nothing uh, tells the story better than looking at the hood of one of those computers, uh, which looks, under, you know, looks at the data and tries to derive intelligence. And that is uh, IBM's uh, Watson, right? a classic example, uh, which beat two former world champions in 2011 uh, in the game of Jeopardy. So it was a remarkable achievement, of course. Uh, but the not so remarkable aspect was at what cost? So Watson was consuming 80 kilowatts of power as opposed to the human opponents consuming tens of watts, right? Um, Watson had 2,880 processor threads and 16 terabytes of RAM. I'm pretty sure the human opponents didn't have. Um, and much of this you know, inefficiency uh, is attributed to the fact that Watson, um, you know, just like any other computing system that we are working with, is still based on the von Neumann architecture, right? That means there's a physical separation between where you store your data and where you process that. And any time you want to perform, uh, any, any time you want to perform computation, you have to move this data from the memory to the processing unit and back and forth. So let's fast forward to 2018, right? That's, yeah, 2018, that is, yeah. Uh, this is the landscape of AI algorithms out of there. I mean, when you say AI, this is what it is, right? Uh, and in all these cases, all of them are running on conventional phonome computers, be it CPUs or GPUs. Okay, there are some ASICs coming into play but essentially they're all von Neumann machines. 
Um, so what we have done is that we have thrown in immense computing resources uh, into this problem of AI, right? But even after that, uh, you know, look at the results. We still need weeks to train certain um, state-of-the-art deep neural networks. So in, in spite of having all these computational resources in our hand. So before we say, okay, let us move on beyond, you know, von Neumann um, uh, computing, of course, there's a lot that we can do in the context of von Neumann computing itself. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, this storage class memory. Uh, the whole idea there is as follows. So if you look at, you know, if you look, zoom into the memory uh, part of the, uh, you know, the architecture there, um, we typically have a fast volatile DRAM and a slow non-volatile flash, right? So that's what we have. But now if we can have access to a large amount of data, which we can store in a, uh, in a non-volatile fashion, and if we can access that reasonably fast, right, then this would of course improve uh, the performance of this computing system. And that is what we typically refer to as storage class memory. So something which in, sits in between DRAM and flash. So there's a lot of activity going on there, and, and right now we have even started seeing some commercial products coming up, which try to fill that niche area, right, between DRAM and flash. Um, then, of course, there are ideas such as processor in memory. I think Andy was alluding to that, right? So there is this idea of uh, using or bringing your processing units very close to the memory system, right? Probably even in the memory chip, so that you can accelerate some workloads, right? So that's what you call processor in memory or in uh, or in, mem uh, in memory computing or near memory computing. Then, of course, there are more exotic ideas uh, like this one, which is being pursued here in Stanford, actually by Philip Wong and so on, where uh, you have this you know monolithic three D integration of memory interlaved with uh, you know, computational layers, right? So this is what you do. So if you look at all these approaches, um, the overarching theme is to minimize the time and distance to memory access, right? But they're all confined within the von Neumann architecture. So we are not deviating from the von Neumann picture, we are still in the von Neumann world, but we are trying to minimize the time and distance to memory access. So what we do uh, is fundamentally different from, it's a distinctly non von Neumann approach, and that is what I wanna talk about. That is the in-memory computing approach. So again, let's look at the, the conventional, you know, the system there. So you have your, the processing unit, you have the memory unit, and um, you, know, you have some data A written in the memory somewhere, right? If you wanna perform the operation F of A uh, on that memory A, memory A on the data, data A, what you have to do is you have to fetch that A, bring it all the way to the processing unit, perform the FFA operation, and store it back into the, into the memory unit, right? And this is what is causing this immense inefficiency. Now let's see, uh, you know, suppose we have another system, slightly different. So you have again a processing unit. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the, the memory uh, here. And besides the conventional memory, assume that we have something called a computational memory, right, sitting here. And now, this A, let it be uh, written onto the computational memory as opposed to the conventional memory. If you want to perform the F of A operation, right, what you could possibly do is you can apply a signal to the computational memory unit, to the A there, and somehow the F of A, uh, you know, gets done in, in place in the memory itself. That's the whole idea, right? It, without ever having to go into the processing unit. So this is the whole concept of in-memory computing. So there are a few caveats here. Of course, we cannot do all kinds of stuff, right? So we can perform certain computational tasks uh, using certain memory cores in place um, without the need to shuttle data back and forth in the process. Uh, but having said that, uh, we can do quite a few things. We can do logical operations. We can do arithmetic operations. We can even perform some optimization problems in this manner. And how exactly are we doing it? Uh, we exploit the physics of the storage devices, right? So we exploit the physical attributes and state dynamics of these memory devices on which you store information. So that's all the idea here. Okay, so before I proceed, are there any questions so far or shall I go ahead? Okay, perfect. So what do these, uh, you know, I talked about computational memory, so what do they comprise of, right? Uh, so let's look at uh, you know, how we store information in our existing uh, memory devices, right? So if you look at DRAM or flash, in both cases, you store information in the charge state of a capacitor. 
right? So in the case of DRAM, you have a capacitor which is in series to a transistor. If you have flash, you have a capacitor which is coupled to the gate of a transistor. So the, the presence or absence of charge is what determines the logical state of zero and one, right? Uh, so clearly, um, I mean, this is the way we have been storing information for decades now. I mean, Dennard invented the DRAM in 1966, right? Think about that. So that is how we have been storing information. There is some recent work on using this type of storage devices to also do in-memory computing, but it's very recent stuff. But I still believe that a better way to perform in-memory computing is using a different type of devices and not the ones based on charge-based storage. And that is what um, I want to show here. So in this, mode of op in this mode of storing information, we don't store information in terms of the charge state of a capacitor, but rather in terms of the atomic arrangements within a nanoscale volume of material. So, um, you know, if you have one atomic arrangement, you have one logic state. If you have another atomic arrangement, you have another logic state, right? Um, and these atomic arrangements you can now alter by the application of electrical pulses. Um, and you can measure these differences in atomic arrangements in terms of the resistance state by measuring the low field resistance. And that way you can decipher in which state you are. And in terms of the physical mechanisms, uh, this spans uh, a wide range of mechanisms, all the way from ionic drift in metal oxides to phase transition in certain types of materials. So that's the whole uh, spectrum there. So what I want to talk about is, you know, you know, in more detail, is one of these things, which is based on the, the phase transition, and, and that is what, what is known as the, the phase change uh, memory. So phase change memory is one such resistive memory device. By the way, these, um, you know, these type of memory is called resistive memory because you are deciphering the stored information, which is in terms of the uh, atomic configurations by the resistance state, right? That's why they're known as resistive memory or memristors or whatever. Uh, phase change memory is one of them. So phase change memory is based on this uh, unique property of compounds of germanium, antimony, and tellurium, uh, such that in the disordered atomic arrangement, in the amorphous phase, they have a very high resistivity, and in the ordered crystalline phase, they have a very low resistivity. Now if you take this material and sandwich them between two metal electrodes as shown here, then by applying suitable electrical pulses, you can reversibly change the phase from the amorphous phase to the crystalline phase, right? And since you have this big difference in the resistivity values, depending on the phase configuration, you can have you know, a very low resistance if it is crystalline and a very high resistance if it is amorphous. And this, of course, you can read back by applying a low field, a low bias voltage. So that's what you do. Um, so clearly in phase change memory, you can have these binary states, which is predominantly amorphous and predominantly crystalline. But uh, we are also able to achieve uh, intermediate phase configurations um, you know, by, by, again, by applying suitable electrical pulses. So if you apply suitable electrical pulses, you are able to get these intermediate, um, you know, or these kind of mixed phase configurations, which means that we can achieve a continuum of uh, conductance values as shown here. So these are you know, the, the applied voltage pulses, I mean the amplitude of the voltage pulse, and this is the, the resistance value. You can see that you can get this continuum, right? So essentially what we have is an analog storage device, right? Because you can get this continuum of states. Um, so, Besides the fact that we can store this continuum of resistant states in these devices, these devices also have some very rich dynamic behavior. So if you look at a PCM device, the, the PCM dynamics is basically um, a, you know, a, an intricate feedback interconnection of electrical, thermal, and structural dynamics. Uh, so you know, it has a strong field and temperature dependence. There is a very interesting thermal system there. In a sense, you know, there, are, there are huge gradients within the, within the device, thermal gradients, which means that thermoelectric effects will start playing a role. But of course, what is also very interesting is that it has very interesting structural dynamics. Uh, such as crystallization and structural relaxation. Um, I will come back to it when I, uh, when I say how we can do computation using the structural dynamics, right? So that is why it's very interesting. So we should be able to exploit the dynamics of PCM devices to perform uh, computation in place. But first, uh, let us look at uh, you know, performing logical operations uh, using computational memory. So 
uh, I will only have a couple of slides on it, but the reason why I want to talk about logical operations is because it is also one of the first, uh, you know, the initial ideas on computation memory uh, came about in the context of performing logical operations. So it's, it's good for the, the, uh, the completeness sake. So what's the whole idea there? If you look at the conventional CMOS logic, right, uh, there's only one logic state. Uh, that is represented in terms of voltage, right? So your input signals are voltage signals, you process uh, on voltage signals, and you output voltage signal, right? In all cases, you have voltage signals. And the CMOS gates, they essentially regenerate the state variable during the computation process. That's what it does. Now, suppose you have uh, these memristive or resistive memory devices into the mix, right? So why not use the resistant state of these devices as an additional uh, state variable for computation? Uh, so that's the whole idea here. So if you take a resistive memory device, let's say in the high resistant state, it is in logic zero, and if it's the low resistant state, it is in logic one. And the nice thing is that we can also toggle them from one state to the other by applying electrical pulses, right? Uh, so which means that we should be able to enable a whole bunch of logical operations just by the interaction between the voltage state variable and the resistance state variable, right? And in fact, people have, over the years, have come up with many such logic families where they created uh, logic which comprised of both these state variables as opposed to just having voltage as a state variable. And why is it interesting? Because this gives you a natural pathway towards uh, seamlessly integrating memory and processing on, on, the, on the same place. So I've just focused on just one such logic family, um, and that family has this very interesting property of statefulness. So what do you mean by statefulness? So stateful logic means that uh, you only have one uh, logic state. In this case, it's not voltage, but it's resistance. So that means you only have resistance as the input and output, right? So that's what you have. So I'll just illustrate that with one simple example of how you could perform, for example, the NOR operation in stateful logic. So let us say that I have these three devices which are uh, hooked up in this particular manner, right? And as I said earlier, in this logic family, the logic is represented only in terms of the resistance state variable. That means, sorry, that means both the inputs are now uh, devices, right? the resistance states. Uh, so these are the inputs and this is the output. Now, first let us initialize the output resistance to say the logic state one, which is the low resistance state, right? Now, if either of these uh, input states is in logic one, which means it's logic, uh, it is in a low resistance state, and if we apply a voltage signal VC here, then at least VC by two will drop across the output state, right? And now, now you can tune your voltage in such a way that when you do this operation, the output toggles from one to zero because of the way in which, you know, the, the circuit is hooked up. Now let's take the scenario where both the inputs are in the zero state. That means they are in the high resistance state. If they are in the high resistance state, and if I apply a VC here, hardly anything drops across the output, which means that the one remains as one. It doesn't toggle. Yeah, so, so what we have done is we have the, the input stored as resistance states and the output is also now, uh, you know, is a result of the logical operation NOR in this case, right? So what we've done is we've implemented the, the NOR operation uh, purely using the resistance as, the, as a state variable. Um, so that is the whole idea behind um, stateful logic. And so this is a very simple thing. So how can we scale it up, right? So the idea is, of course, you can uh, now perform bulk bitwise operations. So you can have, you can port the whole idea into a large array where you don't perform this operation at a single device level, but you can op uh, operate across a whole row of devices. So here, for example, you have you know, this, this row of uh, devices indicating you know, this vector uh, here, and there's an adjacent row here, and you would like to perform a NOR operation and store it here. So what you do, you first initialize all these devices into the low resistance state, one, and now you apply this VC to the row. And what happens? Because of the way the current flows, Clearly, you will get the NOR operation implemented and written onto the adjacent row here. So we are able to perform bulk bitwise operations in a completely stateful manner. And clearly, uh, you know, if you don't want to perform this operation on some devices, you can of course use appropriate isolation voltages to to to, to kind of uh, you know remove them from the from the uh, operation. Uh, 
Um, and clearly the idea is that you know, we can now take more complicated processing tasks, you know, break it down into these subparts, and then finally you can uh, you know, work your way towards a more general purpose processor based on these very basic operations. So that is uh, the idea behind performing um, logical operations uh, in, in computational memory. So any questions? Yes. Time between zero to one and a one to zero transition. It really depends on the devices, right? Um, so you're right. I mean, uh, I mean, this is very simple in, uh, to show in, in, in this, in the PowerPoint setting. But in reality, of course, you have to take care of the switching dynamics and all these effects. So clearly, you need to consider that. Yeah, so the question I sort of had, showing the device that you have with the, the, the Tim Composite and all that. Uh, you haven't mentioned any switching times or anything of that, right? I assume you're going to get into that? Um, not really, but uh, when I, I talked about this, the device dynamics, for example, the electrical dynamics, so uh, there are some very interesting uh, dynamics like called threshold switching in phase change memory. Uh, so we have published a lot of work on that, but unfortunately today I don't think I'll be talking about that much. Okay. But it's a very important... It's yeah, it is in the literature citations. So sure you get your slides to Dennis. Yes, yes, of course I will. You're talking about a bitwise operation between separate rows of a large memory device right. yielding the result yes. inherently. Right. If this were a useful function, could it not have been done with earlier technologies going back decades uh, with RAMs and so forth, not counting CMOS perhaps, but the way any memory works mm -hmm. is to cause bit lines to be pulled high if a transistor is set or cleared, and yeah. not if it's not. And with an existing memory device, pretty much any technology, if you interrogate two lines, and either of them could pull the bit line high, you would have the same function being performed. Yes. In, in fact, the in fact, there is a paper. Technology. Right. In fact, there is a paper out of um, CMU and ETH um, uh, where they show that you can do bulk bitwise operations using DRAM. I think I have cited it in my references list towards the end. So maybe you could look at it. I think I think they're doing exactly what you were uh, yeah, suggesting. So part of the advantage of coupling to this new one technology is that it allows you to do this, whereas you don't need to jump to this new somewhat less well-established technology in order to do this. I'm missing the, the point. The linking two radical technology or linking a technology with a philosophy at the same time generally increases the risk. So Sure, sure. And also, mind you, like I just wanted to, I'm not saying that logical operation is the best thing to do with these devices. I mean, I'll go into other things as well, right? Uh, but, on, uh, but I must also say that even, um, even in this context, there are so many other logical operations that you can implement. There are many different logic families, right? And some of them, I'm sure, have their own merit. Um, I mean, this particular operation that you mentioned, uh, I think there is some work, very recent work, in fact, where they were using DRAM to perform this uh, bulk bitwise operations. Uh, but also the fact that it is stateful is very interesting, that you, I mean, it's non-volatile, right? Which is, which is extremely nice. So you never had to read it back at any point in time. Also, the timing is such that this will be faster in general. Yeah, with, with DRAM, I, I mean, it's not very clear. I mean, I have to like, look in more detail, but uh, yeah. But it, it's a fair, fair, fair question from your point. Okay, so I will now move on to um, arithmetic operations using computational memory, right? Um, so one of the arithmetic operations that you can perform uh, using these devices is matrix vector multiplication. So suppose you want to perform uh, AX equal to B, then what you typically do is you arrange these uh, resistive memory devices in a crossbar configuration as, as shown here. Um, and then you map the conductance values of these devices uh, proportional to the A values here, right? So G11 is proportional to A1. And then um, you actually apply uh, voltage signals along the rows, which is now proportional to the X values here. If you do that, then the, the, the current that flows through the column would be you now proportional to the result B, right? So what you've done is you are just using the multi-level storage capability in this case. So now it's not enough that you only have binary storage capability because you need to map your A to G, right? Uh, so that means you need this analog storage capability. Uh, and we are exploiting the Kirchhoff circuit laws, the Ohm's law and the, and the Kirchhoff's current law. <coughs> um, and what is really nice is that, <coughs> 
we can actually um, you know reverse the process, apply the apply the voltage along the columns, and then <coughs> and then read the the current back through the rows. And what it does is now the multiplication with the the matrix transpose. <coughs> So this is really nice. So you can perform multiplication with the matrix and the matrix transpose at the same time. Okay, so uh, before we go about performing this multiplication operations, um, we should be able to store the, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. So we need to store uh, the conductance values in the devices, right? And for that, we use um, you know, what we call the iterative programming algorithm. So that means um, we need to go to a desired uh, conductance value. So for that, we apply um, a sequence of pulses so that you can go to the desired value that you want to program to. Um, so so I mean, this is an illustration of you know. Suppose you want to go to a G target, then you apply some pulses, then you look at how far away you are from the G target, and then you keep on uh, uh, you know modifying the applied pulse so that you can eventually reach the the G uh, the, the G target value here. Um, in fact, this works beautifully well. So these are now experimental results from our lab uh, on on phase change devices across a large array. We are able to uh, you know go to a desired target value. And then these are the distributions that show how well your algorithm is performing, right? And then how you can go to this, go to these values here. Um, and once you have this desired conductance value, you know, achieved through this iterative scheme, then uh, you can perform like scalar multiplication. So just, this is just an illustration of the Ohm's law, again experimental. So what do you do? You want to perform beta is equal to alpha times c. Uh, you map your um, you know, the alpha value to the conductance value, program the device through the iterative scheme, go there in a precise manner, and then you map your read voltage proportional to the, the C value here, and then you just read back the current, and that would be an estimate of your beta, correct? We can actually perform this operation over, you know, in this case we have shown over 1,024 combinations of alpha and C, that means many different devices programmed to different conductance values and so on and so forth. And then this is now the computed beta hat um, against the exact beta. You can see that it's more or less linear, right? So it's, it's fairly good. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, precision we have when you perform multiplication using Ohm's law. And this is the error distribution, uh, you know, again showing the error distribution here. And what we can also do is we can always average on multiple devices because these devices are really tiny, right? So of course you can have many devices to code the information for you and then you can take the average. Uh, and as you can see, as you increase the number of devices on your average, then you are improving your, um, your multiplication um, precision, right? So that is what you, what you do here. So again, it's experimental data on, on, on PCM devices. Now, the question is, suppose we have a multiplier like that, right, using these devices, what is it good for? In fact, there's a lot of work going on right now where people are using this crossbar-based multipliers for a range of applications. So one specific application that we looked at in Zurich is that of uh, compressed sensing and recovery. So what do we do here? So in compressed sensing, the whole idea is as follows. So you take some signal from a high dimensional space, um, you, uh, you, know, you, uh, you, you compress it into something to a, lo a lower dimension, then thereafter you reconstruct that signal in an accurate manner, right? Um, and what is really nice is that we perform this sampling and compression and simultaneously. That means unlike other compression schemes, we are not taking the whole signal and then we are compressing, but rather as and when we sample the signal, we are compressing it, right? That's the whole idea. Um, as you can imagine, this compressed sensing is extremely useful in several applications such as MRI or facial recognition, uh, you know, or in even mobile phone camera sensors and so on, right? It's extremely useful in, in, in many domains. So how do we do it? It's an extremely simple operation. Uh, so if you look at compression, we are taking a signal from say dimension N, you wanna bring it to dimension M, and if the, uh, compression is done using a linear map, then of course you can do it with a simple 
uh, multiplication with an A matrix, right? So y is equal to ax. So this is the n-dimensional input, m-dimensional output. Now this A matrix can be coded into the memory sieve array, correct? So with the order one time complexity, you can perform the compression. This is the easy part, single multiplication. Now the reconstruction is a bit more tricky. Uh, there you need to convert this m-dimensional signal to an n-dimensional signal, right? And there, uh, typically you go through some iterative procedure. And one such iterative reconstruction is based on this approximate message passing algorithm. In fact, it came out of Professor Montanari here in Stanford. So where uh, you, you, you have this iterative uh, scheme whereby you reconstruct your higher dimensional signal from the lower dimensional signal that you compress to, right? And if you look at this algorithm, what you see is that it has a whole bunch of matrix vector multiplications involving the A matrix as well as A transpose. And both of them, we can uh, use the same array for that, right? So that means we have a single measurement matrix, which is n by m dimensional, rather, right? M by, m by n dimensional matrix. And we use the same array to perform the, the compression as well as reconstruction. That's the beauty of the whole thing. And if you work out the math, you see that in this way, overall, for the reconstruction, we can reduce the uh, complexity from order nm to order n. So that's a significant reduction in the, in the complexity. So does it work? Yes, it does. So we performed experiments uh, on this uh, image compression. Um, uh, I mean, this is actually compress sensing in the context of image compression, where we took this image, which is 128 by 128 uh, pixel image, then we do a 50% um, you know, uh, compression on that image, and then we reconstructed it. Uh, while all the time we had coded the information, the, the measurement matrix onto a PCM array. So we have a measurement matrix which is entirely coded in the PCM array, all the multiplications are done using Ohm's law, and then we have uh, gotten back the result uh, from that. Um, a couple of very interesting points here. So one thing, first of all, uh, the reconstruction is not too bad, right? I mean, given that we had such low precision, right? Um, uh, and by the way, I have also shown here the normalized mean square error as a function of the iterations. I told you the reconstruction is an iterative process. Um, and if you look at the, the normalized mean square error, uh, a couple of things. One thing is, of course, uh, it is not as good as floating point. Uh, it has a higher error floor. But very interestingly, uh, the, the convergence rate is not affected by that, which is good, right? Because the iterative algorithm is still converging with the same speed, even though it is done with lower precision multiplication. Um, if you look at it, it is slightly better than a four by four fixed point implementation, um, so which means that our multiplier is having uh, you know, an equivalent precision of a four, bit, uh, four by four bit um, uh, fixed point uh, operation. Um, and if you had to do the whole thing now, uh, you know, implement an FPG or something, we still have a power reduction of something like 50 times. So that's what you gain. Um, and also, mind you, um, when you look at the measurement matrix, it has a dimension of n by m. Right, so it's a lot of data, and all this data is now re residing in the computational memory, ever having to come back to the processing unit. Right, so that's a big advantage here. So that's a, that's a lot of data that you can store in the computational memory and perform these uh, operations on them. Okay, so any questions on this part? Uh, yes. to set the analog value in the PCM memory. How long did it take to do one of those writes? So uh, it takes like something like six to seven uh, write operations. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, each, each operation. So the, the PCM, the, the write pulses, I mean, it typically it's like something like 50 nanoseconds, five zero. So, so you see you need like six of them uh, to, get, to get it right. Yes. Thousands of cells. Yes. And you do how many at a time? It depends on how many write heads uh, we have, uh, right? Uh, so uh, typically the limit comes from, um, you know, how much current can flow through the uh, through the wires, right? Essentially. Um, but having said that, in all these applications, you are not changing the weights uh, at all, right? I mean, if you look at the the compressed sensing, it's always a measurement matrix sitting there, right? It's never changed once you're programmed. So then it's being used for all kind of uh, compression stuff, right? So it's kind of like a thing that you can amortize, I think. So you just, the, the cost of writing the, writing the array. 
Yes. You imagine the input output devices to a machine like this. Mm -hmm. Aren't they getting a lot more complex? So, how do you program a 5 volt, 3 volt, 2.5 volt input to this? So, those devices get to be. Yeah, but having said that, I, I view computational memory as an extension of memory, right? So you have you have memory, and you have typically you have a memory controllers, right? So even now, if you have a memory chip, right, you have your you, know, you have your memory controller, which is taking care of some of these these things, right? So we'll have a computational memory controller, which will do these uh, conversions that is required. My point was, aren't they getting a lot more complex now by adding these versus? Um, I wouldn't think so because because if you look at uh, you know if you have a multi-level you know flash chip right I mean it does so much stuff right um, even even now uh, it does the iterative programming for example right so many of those things that I mentioned here are already being done in existing memory chips so I I, I cannot see of anything which is substantially different from what is already not there okay so. Uh, Let's now go to computing with device dynamics. So, uh, you know, I talked about logical operations, arithmetic operations. So the question is, okay, can we do a bit more, right? Can we use, can we compute using the dynamics? Um, as you know, for the logical operations, we're just using the binary storage capability. For arithmetic operations, we use the multi-level storage capability, but either of them didn't use any dynamics, right? Um, so this is the vision here. So we have uh, a whole bunch of memory devices sitting there, right? Um, you want to perform uh, F of A operation on those devices. Um, so what you do is you apply an electrical signal uh, to, this, to all these devices, uh, right? And the, the idea is that um, the conductance of these devices now evolves uh, in accordance with this electrical input, and somehow the result of the computation gets imprinted on the memory devices, right? That's the whole idea. That'd be really cool. Um, so one obvious candidate, at least in the context of phase change memory, um, for performing computation is uh, the so-called crystallization dynamics. So what we see is that if you have a PCM device, and if you now initialize it into a predominantly amorphous state, as shown here, then if we apply um, electrical pulses such as these, uh, you know, uh, you know if, you, if you successively apply them, what you see is that the, the crystal front will grow, right as shown here. That means uh, you will progressively crystallize, and which means that your conductance of the device will keep on increasing, as shown here. So if you apply the number of pulses as shown here, uh, as, as, a, as a number of pulses increases, your conductance key, keeps increasing here, correct? And what's also nice is that if you increase the amplitude of the programming pulse, then you have a larger increase in your conductance, as shown here. So, so this is now increasing current. Uh, you see 50 all the way to 100 microamps, and these are the, this is a 100 microamp curve here. So can we use this very interesting behavior for computation? So essentially what we have is, is a non-volatile integrator, right? An accumulator. So can we use it for performing computations? So first I will take, uh, as a first application, I will, I will show how we could use it probably to find factors of numbers. It's, it's more like a toy example, but I think it really gives an idea of how the whole thing works. Um, so let's take a PCM device. Assume that it is initialized in such a way that you know, it goes into a low resistance state um, after you apply X number of pulses, right? Because then that's when it, it completely crystallizes, right? It, it just goes into this state here. Um, the question is, can we use this device to perform, uh, to, fi to find if x is a factor of y? So what do you do? You know, you have, a, you have a larger number y sitting there, and you want to know if x is a factor of y, right? You apply y number of pulses to the device. And, and as you apply the pulses, at any point in time, if the resistance of the device goes to the low resistance state, then you reset it back, correct? And then you keep on doing it till you finish applying y number of pulses. And after the application of the y number of pulses, then you just go back and measure the resistance of the device. If it is in the low resistance state, then x is a factor of y. Otherwise not, right? It's a very simple, very simple algorithm. So this is just a schematic illustration again. So you want to know if 4 is a factor of 8. You apply 8 number of pulses. Uh, you know, these are the 8 pulses here. 
After the application of the eight pulses, you measure the resistance. Oh yeah, the device is in the low resistance state. Yes, four is a factor of eight, right? Um, is four a factor of 10? You apply 10 pulses, you measure the resistance after the application of 10 pulses. Resistance is high, no, it's not a factor, correct? So that is as simple as that. Does it work experimentally? Yes, it does. But also even better, we can do it in parallel. That means I can have, uh, say, you know, different devices initialized to different states. So for example, this device corresponds to 13, 11, 9, 6, and 4. So these are the number of pulses it takes for it to go to the lower resistance state. And then you apply a Y number of pulses to all of them, right? And then you go and check, okay, how many of those devices are right now in the lower resistance state? And okay, those are the ones which are factors of Y, right? So that's the whole idea here. Uh, this is an experimental illustration now in this case. So you have, uh, again, you know, the, I mean, the same, same concept here, number of pulses here. At any point in time, uh, you could just go and check, you know, how many devices are in the low resistance state and you can figure out which those factors are. Just an example, you look at 44 here, right? You will see that the device which corresponds to x equal to 4 and x equal to 11, both of them are in the low resistance state at 44. That means 4 and 11 are factors of 44, right? It's a very simple experiment or, you know, which shows you know, what I mean by computing in place and storing the data in the device in the form of the resistance levels. Um, uh, but clearly, I mean, uh, it, it is more or less a toy example just to illustrate the, the concept here. Um, let's now move on and see if we can solve more interesting problems, right? Uh, and one such problem is um, learning the correlations between signals in a completely unsupervised manner. It's a very interesting uh, problem. It arises in a, in a range of applications. So suppose you have a whole bunch of, you know, event-based data streams, binary stochastic processes coming into a correlation detector. Uh, a subset of these processes are weakly correlated. You would like to find out which ones they are, right? Uh, so you can imagine it comes up in you know, a lot of applications where you probably want to find out anomaly or you want to know which signal is interesting and so on, right? It comes in that context. Um, the question is, can we perform this uh, using this operation using the device dynamics? Indeed, yes. So what do you do? You take these event-based processes, so they are binary stochastic processes, that means they're the ones and zeros, right? So you have n processes, maybe a million of them, right? They are all coming into the, in, they're coming into the PCM array, the, the computational memory. Uh, each of the process is now assigned to um, a single PCM device as shown here. And any time there is a one here, you apply a pulse to the PCM device, a right pulse, right? One of these uh, crystallizing pulses. And the amplitude of the pulse is now proportional to the instantaneous sum of the processes. So this one here, right? At any point in time, you count, okay, how many of them are there? And the amplitude is now proportional to that. I must also say that, okay, before we start the whole thing, we have to initialize all the devices to a high resistance state, fully amorphous state, right? And what you see is that um, as this progresses over time, all those devices which are now connected to the uh, correlated processes, they go towards a high conductance state. And the ones which are connected to the uncorrelated processes, they remain at the low conductance state. So now just by reading back the resistance values of these PCM devices, we are able to determine which processes are temporarily correlated and which ones are not, right? Um, in fact, it is, I mean, this looks very trivial, this algorithm, but what it does is that it is finding out the sum of the covariance matrix of this, of this data here. So that's what it does. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that's what it does, right? With this, with this very simple looking uh, algorithm here. Uh, and this is also one instance where you really are performing a rather sophisticated computational task completely in memory, and then the result of the computation is being stored in the memory itself. So again, does it work? Yes, it does. So we have uh, you know, a million devices in this case. These are all experimental results again. Um, each of the PCM devices is now connected to um, one of these uh, stochastic processes, in this case, you know, uh, these are represented by uh, these flickering uh, pixels here. So each time the, the pixel is flickering, that is, is one of these ones showing up, right? So that's a, the that's a process here. And some of these pixels are flickering with a weak correlation. It's very difficult to figure out because it's 0 0.01 is, a, is the correlation coefficient, right? You cannot really see it. But now, um, 
these, each of these pixels is now mapped to a million devices arranged here. So it's 1,000 by 1,000 devices. And now you can see the conductance values as read from the PCM device. You see it's evolving as time progresses. And you see that, OK, these were the pixels which were temporally correlated. And that information is now completely written into the PCM device. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, this is one instance where we really cannot say where processing is happening and where storage is happening, right? If someone can tell me, okay, where is the processing and storage, it would be, be extremely interesting to see that. Um, and so what we have is we have now imprinted the result of the computation into the memory devices. Yeah. So, so that's, 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 uh, that's the idea here. So we wanted to see, okay, how these kind of algorithms uh, fare against state-of-the-art computing systems, right? Someone could say, okay, I can implement this algorithm in a state-of-the-art computing system. So for that, we chose this particular system with two power eight processors and, um, and, and four GPUs, um, uh, you know, here. And we tried to implement the exact same algorithm that, that, that was used for the, uh, you know, what I, what I talked about earlier, implemented in this system here, right? And it was also implemented with a lot of optimization to make sure that we use all the parallelism and all that stuff. And uh, so this is now the runtime as a function of the number of processes here. And you can see that by the time we reach like 10 million processes, um, even in runtime, our system is a factor of 200 better than uh, the implementation on the conventional computing systems, right? So that's the power of the system. And of course, in terms of energy, we are far superior. Again, orders of magnitude better in terms of the power. So. Uh, so to, to my knowledge, it is one of the um, largest and most significant demonstrations of uh, really in-memory computing using device dynamics, where the result of the computation is, is written into the, into, the, into the devices. Why did you insist on the exact same algorithm? Perhaps there was a better algorithm for the GPUs. I will be surprised, but in this case, we just want to compare you know, apples to apples, uh, right? Your PCMs. I'll be interested in knowing which one, which algorithm that is, though, because two algorithms that we tried. One of them is the K-means, which of course is not more efficient than this. Um, the other one is the one where we sum up the covariance matrices, right? We didn't look for a better algorithm on the GPUs. Um, no, these are the two we looked into. Uh, and so one of them is, but if you have something else, uh, I'd be, I'd be interested. Yeah. A decision to deliberately choose the exact same algorithm. Yeah, here the idea was mostly to try, you know, if, if to, to make a fair comparison between but the it's two. Not a fair comparison. That's just the point. Yeah. You're not taking it. You you may not be taking advantage of the properties of the GPUs. So it's an unfair comparison to say, well, look how much power we save, or look how much faster we are, when perhaps a different algorithm would have made that difference less. But do you have that algorithm in mind, or it doesn't mind? matter whether I have it. Okay. Because I, we couldn't think of anything else. I mean, you know, when you when you go for when you try to find correlations between those those patterns, I mean, the two things that came to mind were, were these two algorithms, right? Right. So I don't know if there's something else that we could try, but yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. Any other questions on this part? Yeah. Collaboration. If you speak about ten billions. Elements, that's a problem. Calibration, I mean, the result, you can fix it with the result, you can calibrate the computing elements, right? Yes. You mean to say where, the, where you put the threshold and so on, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. What is your approach in this? Do you have any? I guess you. I mean, it's. It's. I mean, you should know. Um, you know how many processes you have, and what is the. You know, what is the rate of the process, and how much correlation we expect. So there are some uh, rough. You know, calculations you could do to figure out how to set the set the thresholds. Right. It's basically putting a threshold on the binary classifier. Right. So you can get some idea on. You know, on what it should look like. But you're right. It, it requires some tuning, of course. This looks to me like uh, right now the problem would be where do you get the memristor devices? It looks like you have to make a fairly low level of rights to actually take advantage of this. Is that correct? Um, no. Yeah, you mean to say? Uh, I, I, mean I can't go buy uh, transistor devices off the shelf at 
uh, yes. the local supplier. This is this is a, a, a situation where you're building something with a very specific intent and tailoring it to a particular class of problems. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, but having said that, I think if you look at all the memory manufacturers out there, uh, I mean, uh, they're all capable of doing it, right? Samsung's and all that. Right? Yeah. So, uh, but whether it is easily accessible in, a, in an academic environment, that's a different question. But I think many of the companies, they have access to the technology. Mm -hmm. Follow what he said. Yes. So you actually can get advantage by creating a special purpose machine, not a general purpose machine. Right. Yeah. And, uh, Um, okay, so um, let's move on to the, the next topic, which is, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, mixed precision uh, computing. So uh, I guess the, the elephant in the room so far is, uh, you know, the lack of precision, right? I think that's one thing which people keep saying. I mean, again, it came up in context of calibration, but also, you know, I, I showed you earlier how we perform matrix uh, multiplications. And again, you see that there is a lot of precision issues there. So that is why we start looking into this concept of mixed precision computing to counter that. So that's what I want to talk about. So, so what is the challenge of imprecision? So let's assume that, you know, um, you know, uh, you know in, with, when you compute with these memory devices, um, we often we don't go to the exact solution that you want to, right? But that's okay in machine learning because there are a lot of problems where uh, you're okay, you can tolerate a whole bunch of uh, imprecision because there's no real golden answer when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to some of the machine learning problems. So pretty much like this, you know, this drunken guy who wants to go uh, to his uh, destination here, but he ends up with an approximate solution and he's happy about it, right? So that's, that's, that's one class of problems. But of course, someone could say, okay, no, he has to go to the precise solution, right? What if we need arbitrarily high precision? What do we do? So what you can do is uh, you can give him a GPS, uh, a very accurate one, hopefully, <laughs> which now at any point in time tells him, okay, how far you are away from the exact solution. So if he has this GPS in his hand, then he can afford to make some imprecise steps, right? Approximate steps, uh, but he can keep recalibrating himself and eventually reach the, the final solution. So this is the whole idea or this is what leads to you know, the concept of mixed precision computing, uh, or in the, within the context of computing itself, uh, you will see that many computational tasks can be formulated as a sequence of low and high precision components. So uh, what you can do is when you want to solve a computational task, you can, have, you can split it to two things. One of them, in the first step, uh, you have an approximate solution uh, is obtained, right? And that one typically ha takes higher computational load. And the resulting error in the overall objective is calculated in a precise manner and accurately, right? So that's the second step. And then you keep iterating over it, right? And in that case, you can reach your very high precision, uh, very high accurate solution in the end. So that leads us to mixed precision in memory computing. So what do you do here? So you always use your low precision computational memory in conjunction with a high precision standard phone memory machine, right? Um, and then, we use, um, you know, the bulk of the computation, you still try to perform it on the computational memory unit. But then uh, you do the error correction or error, finding out the error operation that you perform in this precise uh, von Neumann machine. So what you can see is that if you do it in, in the right way, in many problems, you can still gain a lot of aerial and power speed efficiency um, uh, even though we have this uh, von Neumann uh, machine in conjunction, used in conjunction with the, the computational memory unit. So this is a very powerful concept and it's a very good solution towards uh, you know, dealing with the lack of precision uh, associated with computational memory. So I'll show you a couple of examples to, uh, to prove it to you. So one of them is um, the problem of solving systems of linear equations, right? Um, so if you want to solve this problem, if a x equal to b, find x, then one way to do, go about it is you first find an initial solution x, right? And then you start making approximate um, additions to it. So these are the corrections to it, so x equal to x plus z. And how you find your z is by solving yet another problem a z equal to r, but this time uh, in an approximate way, 
we use typically Kylo subspace methods such as conjugate gradient descent or GMRS or one of these approaches. And um, the catch is that the R here, which is a residual, has to be calculated with very high precision, right? So that's a catch. Um, if you look at this inner solver, there are a whole bunch of matrix vector multiplications involved. All that stuff you offload to the computation memory, right? Because uh, in this computation memory unit, we are storing the A matrix, right, which we are using over and over again. So we are not reprogramming it, right? So we only have to program it when you have to solve that, uh, that A x equal to B problem. If the right-hand side changes, it doesn't matter, right? If B changes, it doesn't matter. You can still use the same thing. Um, but for the whole thing, you perform all the multiplications in here. Um, and, and finally, of course, the algorithm runs till your residual is below a tolerance, which you set, right? So that is how, how you solve the problem. So now, uh, these are now again experimental results uh, on, the, on the PCM devices. Um, so this time we perform these experiments on the so-called model covariance matrices. So these are a special type of matrices which uh, have this, you know, this decaying behavior as shown here. They are kind of simulating the, you know, the decreasing correlations, um, you know, between features uh, as you move away from the diagonals, right? So that is what it's kind of capturing. They, they occur very often in, in data analytics pro related problems. Um, and all the matrix multiplications are performed using PCM devices, uh, again fabricated in the 90 nanometer technology node. And this is now the norm of the error between the exact solution and the, and the you know, estimated solution plotted against the number of iterations. Again, it's an iterative scheme. And you can see that for all these matrix dimensions, the error keeps dropping, right? And it's not limited by the precision of the computational memory unit. It is only limited by the precision of the high precision unit. In fact, we did one experiment all the way till it reaches the machine precision of the von Neumann machine, right? Because it's not limited by that. That's a property of the algorithm. So this way, we can beat this problem of, uh, you know, the lack of precision involved in the, in the multiplication and still get a very um, accurate solution. Um, so this is, a, this is one example. So, uh, and, and, and I don't have to convince you that, you know, this is a very useful thing to do in a, solving systems of linear equations, but of course this appears a lot in, um, in problems associated with um, data analytics. So one such problem is, you know, the task of finding the gene interaction networks uh, from RNA expression measurements for cancer and normal tissues. So what you do is you, you, you get the covariance matrix, you find the inverse covariance matrix, and finding the inverse covariance matrix involves solving a whole bunch of linear equations, and all this stuff is done in a PCM device. So the covariance matrix, we programmed it into the PCM array, and then we solved all these linear equations with different right-hand side, and then we obtained these gene interaction networks from the experiments, right? And then, of course, you can see that while some of the uh, gene in, uh, in interactions are preserved, there is a big difference between the, the connectivity graphs between uh, those linked to cancer cells and, um, and, and normal cells, but normal tissues. So just an illustration of you know, how you could use these kind of uh, things in a, in a problem like data analytics. Uh, but the natural question is, okay, what do we gain by going through all this process, right? By mixing uh, the von Neumann machine with, uh, with, the, with the computational memory. Um, in fact, we did a lot of studies, uh, system level measurements, in fact, um, where uh, we used uh, power eight CPUs and, and P100, the Pascal 100 GPUs, uh, as the high precision units, um, and along with the computational memory. And what you see is that we have significant improvements in the time and energy to solution um, as you go to larger matrices, uh, as opposed to doing the full CPU only or GPU only implementation. Right, so we can gain a lot uh, if we use this if we had access to this computational memory in addition to um, just having the processing units. And what is also very nice is that, if at all the in-memory computing becomes more accurate, then your gain in performance becomes more. Right, that's really nice because your convergence becomes faster. So uh, the hope is that as and when the memory devices mature and we start getting better devices, then we can tap into this property. That means uh, things get better, right, as, as, as it goes along. Okay, another uh, application uh, of mixed precision computing is uh, that of training deep neural networks. Uh, so as you know, um, you know, I mean, deep neural networks, they are essentially, you know, loosely inspired by the brain. So you have these multiple layers of, you know, parallel processing units, which we call neurons, um, and they're interconnected by these plastic synapses. 
Uh, and once you have tuned the synapses uh, in a very nice manner, then uh, these networks are able to solve a certain tasks remarkably well. In fact, some of the state-of-the-art neural networks can, um, uh, they even outperform humans, right, in terms of tasks such as image recognition and, uh, and, and, and voice recognition. So that is really, really interesting. Uh, but how are they trained? So these networks are trained based on uh, a, you know, a global supervised learning algorithm, as you know, it is back propagation. So the whole idea is you, know, you take your inputs, you propagate through, through these neuronal layers. It's a forward propagation step, right? And where the synaptic network will now perform mul multiply accumulate operations, the final layer responses are compared to the input labels, the resulting error is calculated, and they are now back propagated again matrix uh, vector multiplications, multiply accumulate operations. At each layer, you will have its own error, and you will now change your synaptic weights in such a way that you reduce your error, right? So it has a forward propagation, backward propagation, and synaptic weight update, three steps. So that is the whole idea behind forward propagation, um, behind back propagation. What we do is essentially brute force optimization, right? We have millions of synapses, and we keep doing this over and over again, over multiple samples, multiple epochs, and finally, everything gets trained. Um, if you look at now, uh, you know, the state-of-the-art networks, it takes days and weeks to train, even on highly sophisticated CPU, GPU clusters, right? So that is the status now. And a big reason for this inefficiency is, again, because you're storing your synaptic weights you know, in one place, and every time you need to perform computation, you need to bring it, uh, perform computation, store it back, right? So that is, that's one big reason for the inefficiency. So can we do better, right? Um, so this is one idea where we can apply this mixed precision approach to deep learning. So let's say that, you know, we, we take a neural network layer, and then we map your synaptic weights again into a computational memory, as shown here. Um, you perform the forward propagation with order one time complexity using this synaptic layer here. Perform backward propagation by obtaining that, that involves transpose operation so that again you use the same array. But the weight update, however, has to be calculated in high precision, correct? And that you perform in your high precision unit. And any time your updated weight exceeds some value, you issue some programming pulses to the devices in a completely blind manner. <coughs> um, so you, you just apply this, you know, you nudge them forward or backward, right? Um, it, uh, and what you see is that this system is able to learn, to train. Uh, uh, so I will, I will show you an example of that, how it works. So we basically took um, like an MNIST uh, handwritten digit classification problem again. Uh, you know, these are the, the input neurons and these are the outputs, of course, telling you which digit it is. Um, and then we used now PCM devices, the synaptic weights, and, uh, and as you see here, this is now the training accuracy um, as a number of the, the epoch numbers here. Um, and after the training process, what you see is that the, the, the network is able to achieve 97.78% uh, accuracy, which is quite respectable, right? Um, and so this is really interesting. So we are able to perform all the forward and the backward propagation in place using the memory state devices by, and, and only accumulating the, the, the weights in high precision, right? Again, it's a classic mixed precision uh, in-memory computing approach, which leads you to this uh, very nice performance. Okay, so that uh, brings to the um, summary of my talk. Um, so first of all, I mean, as I said, because of this explosive growth of data-centric AI applications, we have this immense computing challenge that we need to deal with. And the computational memory, um, I believe, is a significant step towards that. Um, it's essentially a memory unit that can perform certain computational tasks uh, in place. And uh, it comprises typically of what we call resistive memory devices, um, where you store information in terms of the resistance state of, of, of devices. And um, of course, in, in, in computational memory, in some types of computational memory, you can perform logical operations in place. Um, and uh, then, of course, you can do arithmetic operations. And one such very interesting uh, primitive that we can do there is matrix vector multiplications that we can perform in order one time complexity. And of course, you have a wide range of applications, one of them being the compressed sensing and, and recovery that I talked about. Um, another very fascinating aspect is computing with device dynamics. I think a lot can be done in that space. I just uh, showed um, a couple of examples where I used the accumulative 
dynamics of, of devices to perform computation in place, one of them being finding uh, temporal correlations in, a, in an unsupervised uh, fashion. Um, and clearly, um, I think uh, mixed precision in memory computing is, is, a, is a significant step towards tackling this key problem of imprecision that arises in, in computational memory. Right? Uh, and there, I think there are a wide range of applications. I just touched upon two very important ones. One of them is solving systems of linear equations. The other one being uh, training deep, uh, deep neural networks. So I'll just... Um, uh, conclude with uh, just an outlook uh, of how I see the computing systems are evolving over the next couple of years. It's a very difficult task, but I think I st still stick up my hand and, and say something about it. Um, so uh, first of all, you know, you have your conventional computing system. So what you see is that, you know, I strongly think that storage class memory has a place, uh, sorry, has a place, uh, you know, going forward. I, I think it will become more and more prominent. A lot more players will get into that, seeing that there's a market there. Uh, and that will, of course, improve our computing systems uh, for the good. Um, and I think there'll be a lot more research going on in near memory computing. Uh, I think uh, I think it'll get more traction now with all the um, requirements in, uh, in, in AI-related research. Of course, von Neumann accelerators, I mean, GPUs, general purpose GPUs are all over. I mean, they're so ubiquitous right now. But I think there'll be a big push towards ASICs, which are more uh, tailor-made for specific applications uh, like deep learning and so on. So this you would see uh, in the near future. So that's about it for the von Neumann uh, side of things. But in the non-von Neumann side, I think that um, computational memory could start playing a role. Uh, it will also heavily depend on how successful storage class memory is going to be, right? Because then they could feed each other, right? Because uh, the essential element is the same in both of them, right? So, so this is something that uh, that could be very interesting uh, going forward. But even further down the road, I strongly believe that we will start seeing more um, more of neuromorphic coprocessors because, um, you know, essentially uh, our brain is this remarkable engine of cognition. It is for us the existence proof that we can perform, uh, you know, learning uh, with uh, remarkable energy efficiency. So clearly, uh, I mean, that is probably where uh, we will all go at some point, but probably a few years uh, years uh, down the road. Uh, I must also say that there is a nice confluence now of, um, uh, you know, work in computational neuroscience and nanoscale devices, which could all come together to make, you know, make this possible. This whole uh, neuromorphic uh, coprocessors. Uh, and of course, there is uh, you know quantum computing clearly lurking in the background, which we don't know how that would play out, right? So that to me is like uh, my outlook or my take on uh, on how things are proceeding in this space. Um, I would like to thank my my students, my colleagues, my collaborators, um, and also some very generous funding from the European Union as well as the Swiss National Science Foundation. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the write times are, are mostly governed by the how fast the material crystallizes. So it's not really the size of the device that, that plays a role there. So the size of the device is mostly influencing the reset current, right? How much current you need for programming. Uh, but in terms of the speed, uh, it doesn't play that big a role. Um, uh, so if, if, if speed is a concern, there are materials, phase change materials, which crystallize much faster. Um, oh, even one nanosecond if you want. Uh, um, I mean, there are like, um, uh, I mean, if you take like pure GETE, germanium telluride, uh, it, it, it crystallizes much faster than the ones we used here. But there are, there are reasons why we use this material as opposed to that, because this brings something else, right? It's a trade-off in the end, right? What does it bring? What is that? What does it bring? Uh, one thing, one reason why we use this material is because it has a lower current of operation. You know, you need less current to operate it. Uh, because you have larger devices now, right? So that's a big concern for us. So we want to reduce the current with which we can operate it. But if you say, okay, if you're going to smaller dimensions, then your current is anyway lower, then you, you could probably go to the faster one. You see? So it's, it's a multi-dimensional optimization problem in the end. <laughs> I have two sets of questions. I'll save one, basically a hardware question and a software question. I'll, let me ask the hardware question. Yes. I was expecting you to say a little more about the memory architecture because other firms such as, first one I heard was Denelcor mm -hmm. in Aurora, Colorado, and the second which came out of that was Terra up in Seattle, which bought the crane name. 
And what they did with their memory, in, in addition to parity with the correction of the detection, was they implemented full empty bits, and they did semaphore memory. You haven't said anything about how you would deal with race conditions between processors to your memory. You're, I'm assuming you're just using this regular memory, um, but you know, in the database community, Jim Gray convinced the people to say, well, we have this concept, ACID, uh, atomic, consistent, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, you haven't addressed any of that. Yeah, I mean, okay. First of all, I mean, uh, I mean, we are doing, uh, we are using like you know, the memory like, um, so this is all done before the memory controller, right? This is really done in the analog space, right? So we have uh, read and write heads integrated in the memory chip, um, but we are working with real analog values. So, so we, I didn't talk anything about the memory controller because all that stuff is right now on an FPGA. Uh, in that picture that I showed earlier, right? So we have just a pure analog memory chip, and then we have this FPGA wrapped around it, which does all the other stuff. Um, so it's it's quite far from you know working with a real memory chip, right? It is still an emulation of how a computational memory looks like. So that's why I, I didn't touch upon that much. Okay, sure. I, I might be getting hung up in uh, details. I was intrigued by your example of how do you use these technologies to factor one number. If four is a factor of ten, you hit the system with ten pulses and it's a factor of four. Yes. That doesn't seem to scale to whether it's a factor of <laughs> ten to the thirteenth minus seven. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. I, I, that was mostly intended as a, as a toy example to show how you could do some computation and store the result in the memory, right? Hmm. My sense is that you're sort of suggesting a combination of digital and analog techniques. Yes. And the analog techniques are likely, I would assume, would be the limitations before too long. So what, what is the um, precision, more or less, equivalence of the analog aspects of the system? Right. So uh, I must also say that some of the things that I talked about, like the matrix spectrum multipliers, right, like the ones which I showed here, uh, these ones, I think, are, you know, this is something that we can use right now, right? It's not complete. I mean, as I said, if you have a mixed precision architecture, and if you have this rather imprecise multiplier, but if it can do a lot of multiplications in order one time complexity, then this is something that you can incorporate in your computing system, right? So it's not completely exotic at this point. Um, so this uh, precision is equivalent to something like four to six bit fixed point, right? And again, you don't have to really view it as an analog system because you have a digital interface there, right? So you have DAX and ADCs, and you have the memory which is sitting there. Of course, it's a bit imprecise, but that's what it is, right? You can take it into a digital system and you can incorporate it. So this one is not so exotic, but some of the things that I said with the computing the device dynamics is more exotic, and there we need to do more research. It's not ready for prime time yet, but I just want to show that we can uh, use these, these kind of properties to potentially perform computation in place, uh, and that's why I showed these two examples there. And, and in your defense, four to six bits equivalent of an analog signal may be perfectly fine for a lot of citric. A, a true biological neural network does not encode a whole lot of precision into the, the, the yeah. uh, synapse yeah. weights. Um, and you see it all, already with the neural network example, right? So if you have, you know, I mean, if you if you have if you store the synaptic weights of this precision and you enforce it during the training process, then that seems to be enough, right? So so that's that's a very interesting uh, thing, and 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 I think I think mixed precision is also a very good idea in a sense that really, uh, you know, allows us to get this arbitrarily high precision with these, um, you know, faulty devices, right? Uh, which is which is extremely useful, at least in the beginning. I'm a little confused, trying to imagine mm -hmm. what the physical device will look like is, can I have one big array that I can program it to do different application, or do I have to have a specialized right at the beginning? before I manufacture it. I, that DRAM I can use for anything. Yeah. In here, when you build it, it looks like a DRAM in the sense that I can program it to do yes. matrix multiplication, do neural networks and... Yes. So, 
the memory control units has capability to program different aspects of mm -hmm. these things and tie them all together. Right. Uh, you could have like multiple cores in a single chip, right? Because I mean, this is nothing, right? Having one million, uh, one megabyte is one one mega cell is not a not a big deal at all, right? So you can have many different cores. Uh, that's one op option. You could have, you know, one core. You can have a three program, other before you build. Yeah. Or you can program them. Program, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, to me, as I said earlier, to me, I view computational memory as an extension of memory as opposed to a processor, right? So it's really, uh, you're trying to, it should look very similar to a memory chip in some sense. That would be the ideal scenario. Yeah, I was wondering if there are any other uh, types or fields of arithmetic computations that lend itself really well to this. Like, can this do really fast exponentiation, potentially, or discrete logs? Yeah. Because um, that would be, I mean, I'm coming at this from like a, that would be really interesting in, a, in, in cryptography. Mm -hmm. if this can do in, incredibly fast discrete logarithms that could be potentially problematic for yeah. certain uh, algorithms. So I'm just curious if this is. Uh, I, I think there could be, because uh, as I said, I mean, um, if you look at now the, the electrical characteristics of these devices, right? So they have this nice um, exponential uh, field dependence, right? So maybe someone could exploit some of those things, right? So, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's too early days, I think. But I think it's possible to have more complicated functionality um, out of these devices. I thought IBM sold their FAM to Global Foundry. So I was wondering, how did you even get your PCM chip made? Oh, I mean, uh, we still, um, uh, I mean, make a lot of stuff together with Global Foundries, right? So that was the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come again? Um, uh, yeah, so we design it uh, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, but it's not just a PCM chip. We have a lot of... Uh, um, I mean, the, the PCM was not done in Global Foundries because we still have enough fabrication facilities within IBM where we can do PCM, but the, the circuit, the CMOS, was done uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, here's a proper question. <laughs> it's not like it's very famous about this Turing Award for trying to get out of the von Neumann paradigm. And he attempted two different languages, so the question is, what software are you programming? <laughs> Because <laughs> this is this is a very academic audience here. Yeah. If you if you went out, for instance, in the high performance computing world, the first thing they're going to ask you is, "So how's your Fortran compiler?" <laughs> and the thing is, yeah, many people like that laugh, and that's what Danny Hillis did. And then Danny Hillis had to come back, tail tail between his legs, and apologize and says, "Yes, for the connection machine, we finally got around to develop the Fortran compiler." Right, right. Yeah. No, clearly there is a lot of work to be done in the software stack side. But having said that, you know, uh, general purpose accelerators, uh, sorry, um, special purpose accelerators, like you know, I mean, uh, I mean, like classing some of the GPUs, right? I mean, and the, all the infrastructure around it was built up, right? So I don't see uh, anything substantially more different there uh, in this case as well. So, but it's a it's a significant effort, really. You have to look at the like the problems. You have to figure out how to. You know, break it down into, into parts which can be done uh, in the computational memory as opposed to uh, elsewhere. Uh, but it, it, it's also something that we are looking into, um, but I don't have a, 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 any more information on that. Can you I think, yeah. About any library functions that the uh, initial targets of, of high propensity for? for uh, Improvement if ported to, uh, to this as a as the coprocessor. Yeah, no obvious thing is a matrix vector multiplier, right? I mean, this would be a very very um, efficient thing to realize, right? So I would say that would be the first bet. So I have one mm -hmm. small question. Um, Notice in the cases where you did iterative uh, fitting with things, you ended up using L2, ma uh, L2 metric as opposed to L1 metric. Mm -hmm. 
And from that class of problems, L1 metrics are often better. Did you experiment with the two metrics? Um, which one are you referring to now? Or? Uh, in the uh, iteration process where you basically computed a, a distance and then minimized the distance. And mm. I don't remember mm -hmm. which section it was. So for, for, for compressed sensing, there is an approach of using the L1 norm, uh, yeah. uh, because where you exploit the sparsity. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, I don't think it performs really well uh, in the end, uh, compared to the, the approximate message passing, for example. Well, uh, yeah. We'll right. OK, sure. Very nice. Thank you.